Good to see you. And good to see so you. Too. How, how, what would you like to talk about today? <clears throat> right. So, you know, the, the whole interview uh, came up actually, uh, you know, with the questions I ask you about Third Row Gallery. Um, but because we decided to go for, um, you know, something, something bigger on Zoom, I, I just couldn't not to take opportunity to spoke, speak about your books. Sometimes uh, easier, sometimes in the, in the real organic moment of a face-to-face -face conversation, it's very different than just writing back, which, you know, I, I don't do those kind of interviews anymore because that's not the way I was trained as a journalist anyways. So, you know, I think if you're going to talk with somebody, either talk to them on the phone or see them in person. I mean, I understand in today's world, we got to write a lot of things. We all do. You do. I do every minute of the day. But, you know, um, I think this human connection is, is, is become even more important today. So Yeah, I agree. I agree with that, definitely. So, you know. Uh, I'm and so stepping you. back. Uh, let me just, you see that print? That's from you guys. Yeah. And I, I am with him every single day. So I'm with Cardiff every single day. So yeah. well, let's hey, start. Uh, you know, to, to start with, I just wanted to say, um, that I'll share with you a little bit, uh, a little story that, uh, you know, of a young boy um, uh, growing up in Poland. Uh, who, you know, was starting to get into photography. He wasn't really interested in school, didn't do well in school, uh, smoked weed, did, uh, react, uh, you know, recreational drugs and whatnot. But then photography uh, happened. It was actually, um, it was actually uh, running away from uh, obligatory army, um, you know, two years in the army. Um, and uh, the boy picked a uh, photography school uh, to go to. And while he was getting ready, he was photographing forests and all that. And then in Polish television, um, a documentary about photographers were played like daily or weekly, I don't remember. And there was uh, this, uh, inter uh, this, this documentary about Joseph Rodriguez uh, shooting, shooting, uh, shooting uh, gangs uh, in LA, um, you know, and uh, it just blew the boy's uh, mind up, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so we can do something like that with the photography, especially that boy was listening to rap and all that from America, not really understanding the word, uh, but, you know, uh, enjoying the music and the sounds of the voice of, of rappers, not ha having no idea what it is about, but like stylistics. And um, yeah, and that 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 um, these images, uh, you know, just, just blew his mind. There was like no no internet at that time, not much at least. He would go everywhere. He couldn't get a book. He couldn't get any photographs. So he would go to internet cafe, just find some on one page. I think there was interview um, uh, with with you, and um, you know, just few images. And he would download these images to. Um, uh, to to uh, and record on just to to have them and stuff you know um, and this boy was me actually um, and, oh, and yeah yeah, yeah. I, uh, wow. and where I'm going with it uh, like I can say that photography changed my life uh, you changed the way I see photography how I started to photograph um, I wonder if you could you had someone like this and I'm speaking about photographer who um, who would influence you to the point that uh, you know you 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 find that you, you realize your way of seeing you you find yes. your your way okay. uh, was there anybody like that there definitely was all right so um you know i probably was a little bit deeper into my mm, tough city mm -hmm. living situation as a teenager than yours similar 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 you know we sometimes don't fit into the northern european school model which is what you were taught in poland i was taught that in new york right and sometimes we especially when you're young i think you know you carry a lot that you can't always express Right? Why didn't Bartos or Joseph didn't fit in school? Why did he go that way? Or why did he not learn what he was supposed to be learning? 
we're not all fit into that model as human beings, just as a human being, just because if we can use me as an example, because I wasn't reading or staying focused in high school, you know, it was a different time for us anyways. It was the 19, late 60s. So there was a lot of drugs and rock and roll and all that great culture that we all grew up with, even though it's older, but it was a magical time for young people to be out just like it is today. The only difference today is that you have too many other uh, uh, messages coming out to young people vis-a-vis -vis the internet and phones and everything else. So trying to figure out <coughs> what we were doing out here as a young person, I was just having fun and then I got addicted to you know, a harder drug called heroin and that kind of turned me into a bad path and then I think you already know the path and mm -hmm. what happened as a as a juvenile and, and experiencing that incarceration in that locked up jail called Rikers Island. Um, and I, I, I didn't learn the first time, Bartos. It took me two times to, to get the wake up call, right? And then something else happens to us when we're younger. When we start getting older, like 19 turns into 20, 20 turns into 21, oh, now we have to grow up and be adults and have a job and think about a career. And that's a lot of pressure for a young person. And today it's even worse than it was when we were growing up, right? So I, I, I think all that stuff's going on inside of me. I come out, I mean, of jail the second time. And then, you know, I had to fix the addiction problem. All right, so we got on to something that was very popular here. It's called methadone. Mm -hmm. It's popular in Europe too. And um, so that enabled me not to be, have to worry about going out for money. And so I got a job working at a factory making shoe polish, you know, the stuff we clean our shoes. Yeah. <laughs> the stuff Ceausescu loved so much because he loved clean boots. <laughs> but, but, so I was, I was doing that. Let me just close the door for a second. Hold on. Okay. Uh, so I used to take, I used to take these walks home from work because I was living close by to my job. And um, one day I walked past this building called the Brooklyn Children's Museum. And in the window, there was a bunch of different classes that young people could take. And there was photography was being offered by this um, professional African-American photographer um, called Buford Smith. His name is Buford Smith. And he's still alive today. He was my mentor. Right. So he, he exposed me to photography in a very, very amateur way, right? Shoot Tri-X, you know, I had, I had enough money to buy an East German camera called a Practica, you know, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, it was on after that. You know, I used to roll my own film and make my own cassettes because that was cheaper and then got my deck tall and, and I created a darkroom in, in my house, in my apartment, and I'm still, you know, that addict, you know, but, but now things are starting to shift, right? right? Oh, wow, I can create something. So by me going through that process with Buford Smith, who we're still friends today, and I'm going to show you a video that we're making now. It's a, it's a TV series called The Darkroom Masters. So they're going interviewing all these people. So it's a good time that you're coming in to, to ask some questions. So I yeah, so, but it was all amateur. It was all amateur. And while I was going to school and getting myself better, because, you know, I lost 10 years of my life, you know, 17 to 26. You know, I wasn't a normal teenager. I wasn't normal. I had to deal with poverty, addiction, my criminality, my changing my thinking. So, you know, that took about 10 years. And then, you know, after that, you know, I, I went to university to study something very different, which is called graphic arts. Right. So I learned the art of printing, right? The printing press, paper, inks. So that was the beginning of the path. And that was, I would say, 1980. I was already now clean and, you know, 
in a different place, but not really in photography. Not, not yet. Right. So we'll get there. Um, in one of your books, uh, you mentioned uh, Fred uh, Ritchin, and he actually writes uh, an afterwards uh, for one of your books. Um, can you tell us about this, uh, uh, you know, uh, working relationship? You've uh, you've been his students of the, uh, student, obviously. Um, right. Was he a right. big influence. Right. Well, Fred Fred Ritchin was the. I mean, he was a very high caliber <laughs> editor. I mean, I didn't know when I applied to school who Fred Richin was, right? Mm -hmm. And when he, he developed the photojournalism and documentary pro program with Cornell Kappa, right? At the old ICP, very different school back then. It's not like it is today. Um, and so coming into his classes, which I studied with him for a year, and then we became friends over years and then worked with him on Pixel Press and other things we did together. And Katrina, he opened up a door to me that I had never seen before in my life. Because now, now we're different, we're older, right? I mean, this is 1986, I'm 37 years old, I'm going back to school again. We got the scholarship to study documentary photography under the, under the advice of Fred Richin. And every week, Fred would bring in photo essays from all the magazines. So magazines was something that was always on our tables. Show us the slideshows of Eugene Smith and Cartier-Bresson and, and bring in, who does he bring to class? I mean, who my teachers were? Mostly Magnum photographers. We had Kudelka come. We had Sebastian Salgado come. I had, uh, and they would come to lecture, but you know, we were all like eyes open, you know, and, and Mary Ellen Mark and, Eugene Richards, Gio Perez was a big influence on me as well because Gio helped me with my, with my path, right? So, so Fred Richin opened up this world of, you know, if, if you can't travel, because none of us could, right? We were gonna bring the world to you. And he brought the world every single week it was like that. Now, the school was different at the time. I had a student, I had a classmate who was from Iran I had a classmate who's my best friend today, Didier Ruif, who you should interview at some later point as a Swiss photographer. He's incredible. His path, we've done the same thing. Um, and then it was uh, can, a student from Canada, from America, from Asia. From, so we had this multicultural group of students in a classroom. And I think you're in Cardiff. So you, you understand living in the UK that there's this, melting pot of cultures that come together, whether politically it's correct or it's not correct for whatever the issues are. So that opened up my world. That kind of opened up the ideas about seeing the world because I'm a, I'm a city kid. So I, Fred Richin really did a lot for my, for my life and for my career and I honor him and respect him always, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. Uh, he actually mentions about the project you've done with uh, your fellow students uh, in Harlem, actually. Um, and then and the, what we have as a book, uh, Spanish Harlem, is a, your personal follow-up. Um, this is something I wanted to ask you about, because you sure. seem to do what actually is pretty exciting to me, like slow journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you are, you, are you, you know, when you started to work, um, uh, you've been part of the, or, you know, the media and, you know, you, in your East, um, East Side stories, for example, you mentioned about, uh, you know, how frustrated it was, you know, uh, that they picked the, the most, the, the images of, um, you know, of um, violence uh, over the other images and, you know, you, you kind of struggle with that. So you are part of it, but you also try to change the perception. Could you, could you speak about this struggle a little bit? Sure. I mean, um, well, first, let me just go back to the first project. I mean, here, here's how that it was called the gentrification of East Harlem. Mm -hmm. Now, we're all green, meaning we're all students without any experience. OK, so <laughs> the famous Bruce Davidson, who had photographed East 100th Street, very famous book, very famous work, uh, which we all studied and eyes open. You know, that was done in the 70s. This is now the 80s. And they're asking him if he can come back and shoot. And he was busy. So he suggested to Fred Richin, 
to ask the class to go up and take on this initiative. So one day this project needs to be turned into a multimedia project because we have the, the pictures and we have the sound. It was actually, we were ahead, Fred Richin was ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. This was like the first multimedia that's ever done, right? So what we did was nine students didn't know the community as much. We went up to photograph some of the bad buildings, right? The issues, some poverty, some of the fires, the demonstrations at night. Now it's the beginning of crack. It's the beginning of AIDS. So there's a lot of things hitting this community at the same time. So I took it upon myself to go as far as I could. I worked about a year and a half in black and white, which is, could be another book, actually. It's mm -hmm. sitting in my archive. But um, we'll get there eventually. But I think when I graduated Bartos, I went to go work at Black Star Photo Agency. Uh, Fred Richen suggested, you know, maybe you should go work at an agency. So I did. And that place was great for me. Howard Chapnick, God rest his soul, was one of the best men I ever met next to Fred Richen. They really helped a lot of people. And, and so um, while working at Black Star, I became frustrated. You know, you're a photographer, you're working inside, you know, you're seeing everybody else coming in, you know, coming in, Donna Ferrato, Mary Ellen Marks works coming in, all kinds of great. And you're going like, wow, I want to do my... So I began going back up to East Harlem after graduation mm -hmm. in 86, while I was working nine to five. I worked on the weekends. And then I decided that I wanted to shift because I needed to also work professionally. And the only way to work professionally, I think you know this, was to shoot color, right? Uh, you know, only Sebastian Soldado and Kudelka could shoot black and white because of who they were, right? Or Mary Ellen Mark. So I, had to, I learned the... I call it the art, the art of shooting Kodachrome slide, which was very, very hard to do, right? And I began shooting slowly on the weekends, 1986 into 87, the whole, uh, my whole journey in Spanish home. Now that is, I'm just a turtle walking very slowly to this place, starting with street photography, going to churches, going to schools, eventually getting to families and to their homes. And, uh, and with, that, with that, I think you can understand this in photography. When you hit a milestone, a milestone could be like, you know, you know Bartos has been walking around this block, for, you know, for the whole week and you haven't made that picture yet, right? You're looking for that picture. And then suddenly on that late Friday night, all of a sudden you make that picture and you go like, wow, I made that picture. Now you feel you did something. You know, it's yours, not anybody else's. And that gives you the strength to want to go further. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you know all the mistakes. I know all the mistakes and all the slides I threw out and everything else. But, you know, it was, it was that. So, and then I guess, I guess I was kind of hooked on photography at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great work. I kind of uh, went ahead with my previous question going to East Side Stories already, but um, having you talking about uh, the book, I want to ask actually about uh, reprinting it. Uh, it's not the right word because it's a completely different beast. Um, why did you decide to come back to it? Um, uh, who made choices before? Like you, you obviously choose different images. You add something to it. You have images of the same scene, but uh, so, you're you know. talking about the Spanish Harlem book, the yes, reprint yes. of the Spanish Harlem. Okay, great. Um, actually, you know, it was a Polish Polish designer who designed yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> you see his name in the back of the book. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, um, but he went on to open a restaurant, so I don't know what happened to the guy anymore. But why I went back was because. The original book, which I have here, give me a second here. This, yes, you, you have one, I have one. Okay, so this original book, that one you're holding your hands, wasn't printed the way I wanted it to be printed. Uh, there were images that were left out, you know, and so I thought it would be time to, to do a reprint. And it's a hardcover, so it's a pretty solid book, you know. And uh, so that was the reason for me to go back to look at the at, at, at this work. Yeah. 
that's actually going to lead me to another question. Um, uh, it's, Before I get back to, oh, wait, hold on one second. But okay. this question you asked earlier about East Side stories, we should get back to at some during the conversation. Yeah, definitely. I very, will, very important. But anyways, go yeah. ahead. I will get back to it. Let's just keep it like I, I, I jumped ahead. But yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. This is fine. I just, I just didn't want to miss that point because yeah, that's yeah. I'm definitely gonna ask that because East Side stories. I actually, uh, I, I am very interested in that book, uh, especially in the, you know. Uh, uh, backstory of it. Um, so speaking of that, you know, I noticed that um, you kind of created a structure for your books, not all books, but uh, many of your books. Uh, and that's photographs, obviously, the, the, the most Im important ingredients. You have uh, uh, essays uh, written by collaborators, mm -hmm. uh, quite often by uh, Ruben Martinez. Um, and then you have your diaries. And um, why did, why why did you feel it is important to include your personal background stories uh to those images um that's one and uh, could you tell me about uh, a storytelling how important it is actually for this for storytelling or the way you tell stories sure well you know i i, I i'm schooled now schooled meaning that you know i've, I've been educated by some of the greatest storytellers of, <laughs> of that generation. You know, I mean, it was, you know, I mean, it was, I took in a lot, Bartos. I mean, I was the kind of photographer student and even novice, even an amateur photographer coming out of school now, I had a lot to learn. There was a lot to look at. So, um, and, and at that time in the eighties, I was studying a lot of European photography. Mm -hmm. So when I started seeing August Sander, when I was starting to see Duanou, Roni, if we want to talk about the French school, mm -hmm. uh, Lartigue, you know, I mean, we go back. You see, the thing about photography today, what really frustrates me, Bartos, uh, you know, um, with students is that they don't look back, you know, they kind of always on plasma. So they're always looking at things that were done today, or maybe if they go back 10 years, it would be amazing. So I, I was taught, oh, in a way, kind of like a way a method actor is taught, right? You're in the UK, which has the most amazing history of cinema and theater and literature. Okay, so, you know, I'm taking in all of this, right, to understand how are we going to look at the human condition, Joseph Rodriguez? How? Okay, you know the city, you know this is my world, you know it well, um, but there's a whole world out there that you don't know, and, and the camera can allow you to kind of explore and see worlds and bring back stories. So, when I think about the process of how I work with this 35 millimeter frame, it's very cinematic for me. Because as a child, to all the trauma that I had to experience, I was in the cinema a lot more than I was in the book. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much from the movies, how to dress, how to kiss a girl, how to, you know, I, I, I fell in love with the older, black and white cinema from Poland, from Italy, from Germany, the, 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 Vi the Weinbar, the, the Wein, the, you know, what, what's it called, the Weinbar, the, the tradition of the filmmaking from Germany back in the 30s, you know, you know this was all roots for me mm -hmm. that I didn't understand. And Gilles was the one who told me all these references that you put in the back of your head are going to eventually help you when you're standing in front of something you don't know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I had this kind of visual diary, so to speak, in my head, right. which I, I, I started to articulate. And every pro professor, every teacher, and, and Fred Richen included, he said, keeping a diary is very important for you because you're on an, a very solitary path. You're by yourself. You can't photograph with other people. It's different than war photography when you you need your these photographers next to you to keep you safe. But most of the time you're on your own. Mm -hmm. 
you know, so, you know, here I am, if, if, if I can just go to Romania, for example, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I see what happens. I'm living in Sweden. It's May, it's 1990, it's 89, right? So 1989, December, oh my God, boom. Then I see what National Geographic is doing on the country, you know, in Kopsomika, for example, the coal town. And some of the things were happening in Poland, some of the things were happening all over Eastern Europe and Albania. And so I'm like looking at this bigger lens about what's going on here, right? The fall of the Berlin Wall. There's a lot of things happening in that region that I wanted to take a look at. And, you know, believe it or not, you know, the movies that were ex sort of opening up my dreams, right? Because I would write these in my little diary, right? That old Bela Lugosi Dracula movie, <laughs> I've seen it a million times, or the old Frankenstein movie. I mean, the way they, Bartos, it was the way they lit. The way black and white film was used back then was just, I mean, why can't I watch that film a thousand times and still be like that? So there's a, there are these references that are coming through school and in real time. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing in a journal. Now, I, I'm gonna get these out here for you, just so you can see what, is here. Now, just give me one second. I got some no patience problem. here. One second, one second. Um, so, here is, here is Spanish Harlem. Right. Here is the bag of Spanish Harlem. Okay. Here is one, mm -hmm. two, now here's, I'm gonna read you a quote, okay? This is something that from Spanish Harlem, which really sparked something for me and why I continue to do. This is 1986. Mm -hmm. Culture gives identity. Identity gives dignity, respect and freedom to think and to question. Mm -hmm. That was it. I wrote it right there, right there, yeah. right there. And Gio was the guy who always said to us, you know, carry around. So these, these journals here, this is National Geographic when we're working for them, right? right? So, so the importance of a story, I think, and this is why I get a little frustrated on Instagram with the way people use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand it's, a, it's a money-making platform for Facebook. I get it. I get it. We all, you know, it's about happiness and food and family and all that stuff. I get it, but I don't use it that way. I use Instagram as a storytelling platform with captions. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm tired of looking at street photography going, oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's starting to look like Target. I mean, Target's a company here that sells a lot of nice, beautiful things, clothes and everything else. You know, I, so going back, going back to the process at the beginning, I, I don't know anything. Bartos. I'm, I'm really, I just don't know. I'm just opening up a door and I'm going through the door. And, and the journals become more like a therapist for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why the journals are... Right. Yeah, but you, you, I understand you, you, you write in journal. It's, um, you know, it helps well, you with the process. Yeah. Now, the question is, why do I include it in the book? Why is it important yeah. that the That's a very important question because, because east, side, east Side stories should be studied by students of photography. Mm. Well, I mean, that's up to you to say. I don't usually put that out there. I mean, it's for the critics to say. I, I, I think it would be helpful, but you know, I, I think I think let me explain what I think it's really important here. When I'm shooting Spanish Harlem, it's a community that's in the news pretty regularly with its poverty and its crime. So growing up, you'd hear all the bad stories. You'd see them in the newspaper every Sunday. And I knew that there was a lot more there, right? Than just that, right? I mean, this, these, some of these quotes, like, you know, like this, um, this one, one boy who, who says to me, he doesn't have a father. I know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. So I got a, I got his message in here in the original. This is in the original uh, 
Spanish Harlem book, you know. Um, and then, and then, you know, I write the diary of like May 31st, 1987, you know, I mean, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at misery. I mean, it's tough to look at these drugs and poverty. That's on page 57. You know, I, I, I you know, I'm looking at that's in, in the old book, not the new book. All right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's the diary. As I sit on the fire escape, the stench of rotten food and dead rats fill the air. I smoke a joint just to, you know, I smoke some marijuana just to kind of relax, right? And dull my feelings. It's tough coming back to, to a place full of drugs and decay continuously. I photograph the children. How do they feel about all of this? Are they too young? What is poverty? I start questioning what I'm seeing different grades of poverty to be without makes for an escape. So what I wanted to do is to just give the reader a sense of who was behind the camera and what he's seeing and sharing what others are telling us in the world. So it becomes more personalized, right? It's personalized, but I also am doing it for a reason. And the reason is that if you study journalism in our country, you know, if you go way back to when we had slaves here, we had our own presses. We had black people and, and Latinos and we had, but that was all kind of taken down to the capitalist model and the white model and all the other political issues that you can see. So we have stories that we, we can tell, mm -hmm. but they, but, but I want I want the reader to understand that I, I know what I'm looking at. We're not just a photojournalist that's dropping in here and just gonna grab what you can grab. And even and a lot of great photojournalists have good hearts, good people, great people. But you know, I was just Jill was the one who told me. He gave us an assignment. This is an amazing assignment. I'm gonna share this with you. And now, now it's gonna be blown out because this is like <laughs> some Harvard education assignment. Mm -hmm. So he says to you, I want you students to collect a hundred images you wished you would have taken. So that meant we had to go in the library, get all the books, tag the pictures we really liked, put them in a copy stand, photograph them. I still have the slides here and we make copy slides, little copy slides, and then we preview them. But here's the master, here's the maestro. So every student gets a review with him. It's almost like the photography college in the University mm -hmm. of Cardiff. You get a review, right? You go to the review, right? And, but usually there's two or three people. It's just him. So he sits in his table in the classroom and it's just me and him. And I lay all my slides out and he looks at them. And Jill is that kind of guy. He doesn't say a word. He's <laughs> making you all nervous. And then, and then he comes out and he goes, and he sees all my images. And I got all kinds of images in there. I got fashion in there. I've got, you know, social injustice, all that black and white stuff from, from the South. And he goes, what are you so angry about? And I told him, I said, you know, I grew up this way and this has been, this has not been good and that's not been good. He goes, you know what? Use that anger. You know, you and have what the question. picture, and I give that assignment to all of my students, and it changes your life if you take it seriously. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, because it's merely going to, he's going he, what he's trying to do, and, and this is the amazing thing about Gio, he was just like a psychotherapist. He sat there with his feet on a table, on the light table, and I'm sitting there. You know, and like, yeah, I'm angry. He goes, yeah, well, just use that. So he would always say, we come to class. And this I got to add in there because this is very funny. We come to class, nobody has any work, right? And we're all depressed. Now, every, every student goes through this shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse my language. But we all go through this stuff, right? <laughs> so he goes, hey, he says, you, you I said, oh, I'm not really, uh, I didn't have much luck this week and it's been really down and I feel really down. He goes, 10 rolls of triax. And another student would raise their hand and go like, I had it. 15 rolls of triax. So he was like a doctor writing a script and his medicine was film. 
<laughs> go out and shoot more film and you'll find your voice. I mean, that's just brilliance. And that's thanks to Fred Rich and that's where it all comes from. Yeah. Fantastic. You actually answered one of my later questions about anger because the anger comes up in your books quite a lot. Uh, anger returns, you know, uh, even your uh, collaborate uh, co uh, people who wrote essays for you speak about that anger. Um, and one point I was actually um, taking from reading the Harlem book and East Side stories and looking at the images is like, it really feels like you're photographing yourself through uh, by looking at others. Uh, they feel really personal. So you kind of, you know, already uh, mm -hmm. mentioned that, uh, which is mm -hmm. great. Now, my question is coming back to diaries. Why mm -hmm. did you drop diary in the new edition? Um, that was it was a design thing. I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't really have a connection with the, with the designer. It was very much over email. Mm -hmm. It was, I would never do another book like that. Cause if you look at taxi, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the beginning of the journey for me. Right. And you could see how we work because my friend and the artist who designed that book, we have a collaboration like the way I collaborated with Ruben Martinez, the writer, you know, we, we have this, so if you, when we were doing East Side Stories, I had a great designer, a Yuko Uchikawa, she's a Japanese woman. And uh, I had a lot of information, right? I had these journals, I got like five journal books and uh, record album covers and old magazines. And I asked the young people, ex-gang members, uh, gang members, you know, how, how should this book look like? What should it look like? Mm -hmm. So they brought in the Virgin Guadalupe, they brought in this, 1963, 64 Chevrolet car, you know, they brought in, you know, these ideas. Now, all we did was take their ideas and articulate them, you know, even with the old English lettering, you know. Um, so, but to answer your question, the reason why the journals aren't in there now is because in the Spanish Harlem book, it's, it's simply because that connection was not there, right. you know, okay. and there was no time to really discuss it in that way. So. Um, to, 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 to tell you, I, I think the book is uh, far superior than the first one, but uh, I really miss um, uh, di uh, diary entries and also the amazing essay by Ed Vega. I thought, yes. I thought that worked amazingly in that book, you know, introduction of that, you know, I, I, I almost felt it, smelt it and all that. And then you go back to, you know, not so great reality. It was great, right. great introduction. Uh, so yeah. I'm glad Thank I have both. Um, speaking of uh, essay stories, let's move on because, you know, sure. it's all one hour. No, that's all right. Don't worry about the time. I got you. It's okay. 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 Brilliant. Um, so East Side Stories, um, you obviously, you know, uh, follow the news and all that. You see um, uh, information about gangs and all that and uh, how one-sided they are. Uh, you realize you want to tell that story. Um, what happened uh, then? Uh, you know you want to do the project. Um, what do you do? You call a few people or you just arrive to LA and it's like, okay, now what? How much exactly, preparation was exactly how it happened. I mean, it was like I went to Romania. I didn't know anything about the place. And um, I mean, research wise, it's like I've said in, in several interviews, it was all about the music. It was the way Bartos was when you were younger and you were connecting to East Side Stories through the music. You may, you may not have known what they were saying, but you connected. And I did know what they were saying. And I can tell you at that time that um, these rappers, they were like reporters mm -hmm. of the street. They were telling the true real stories like the NWA guys, for example, you know, they turned into a big Hollywood movie, right? You've seen that straight out of Compton, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I know. So, so, so you get all the movies. So, you know that and these kids really did have something to say. And that's what drew me to, to Los Angeles. I mean, what also drew me was, you know, the Rodney King situation. Not, not that I want to photograph police in that situation. That comes much later, obviously, after, uh, after East Side Stories. But um, I knew our American history. So when I went there, I already had 
the autobiography of Malcolm X that I've read three times. I had that book with me, my original copy, you know, that was my Bible, right? And so, um, and then I also was reading Langston Hughes, who was a very big African-American poet and writer here. And the book was, I, I wonder as I wander, right? So I'm what, you know, it's a beautiful title of a book because he was on his own voyage, right? Back in his time, going to the Soviet Union as a black African-American artist. That was a fantastic story. So I had those little um, references and that was it. Mm -hmm. And I flew, I'll never forget it, flew, I arrived at night <laughs> in Los Angeles. And I can't begin to tell you how that feels because I never drove 80 miles an hour. I mean, I thought I was on the Autobahn. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, you know, you don't know where you're going, all that stuff. So I didn't have any body to help me. I was completely alone. That's where those journals come in. Oh my God, the anxiety and the stress. And, oh my goodness. So all I did was I got in a hotel, the next morning, I bought all the newspapers. I turn on the news, and then I start to pick up where things are happening. Right, so I drive to maybe a funeral and see if there there was a way to make a picture. Then I found this place called the Community Youth Gang Services, right, which is nothing but a youth place, a place for the youth to go after school, you know. But there were all these ex gang members there, mm -hmm. so. And eventually I met with one African-American blood gang member, ex-gang member, who's changing his life, who brought me into his community, into Watts, Cal LA, Los Angeles. And the first question I asked, I wasn't interested in gang members with guns. I was interested in families. I mean, that's the true story. And that's the, you, I can read you my grant proposals, all the, all the stipendiums I got from Sweden even. I got a stipendium to do this work. Mm -hmm. right. It was more about the families. So I asked the family, I said, tell me what's the difference between the riots of 1992 and the riots of 1965, mm -hmm. right? Which James Baldwin talked about and, you know, these, these great, all that video stuff that was there. And then it started. She, this grandmother started telling me, well, you know, back then we had factories. Mm -hmm. We didn't have crack. We didn't have guns. Mm -hmm. Factories disappeared. They went south to Mexico, as you know the story, right? Cheap labor. And then what do you do when you come out of high school? No place for you to work, right? These kids aren't going to go to UCLA or, you know, these big universities. They can't afford that. So, so you stay in your community. It's what you do, you know? I mean, that's, that's you know, it was like that for me when I was younger. I went to high school and I worked in a factory. So, you know, and maybe eventually you get a better job in the factory. You know, you move up, right? Mm -hmm. Buy a car, you don't, you're not out here shooting people and dealing with that. You just want to have your girlfriend and have a baby. And, you know, that's what most people want, right? So, mm -hmm. so I knew all of this stuff, you know, and then I had my own family history, right? With my own addictions and my own criminality. So I would never go in there and try to act like the way people do today and talk about themselves so much. I would just went in there with, with a notebook and questions, <laughs> like you're asking me now, you know? So the process is very simple. It's a hard process, but this is what I do. I listen more than I shoot. Mm -hmm. And that's painful. It takes a lot of time, so much. Um, you actually speak about your frustrations, um, you know, about gaining trust and, you know, uh, I think there is a situation where, um, you know, you are already with, uh, with, uh, with a crew, with gang members, you know, just, uh, you know, um, hanging out on some party and then there is this newly released um, from, from prison uh, 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 guy and he questions you and, uh, you know, you, uh, and then you mentioned two or three guys, I, I don't know the number, but these few guys who actually said, oh, Joe, what you do is deep. Um, um, how, how frustrating it is, how, 
I, I assume it sets you back a little when you have a person, again, you have to gain this trust again, or you just, you, you try to do that, or you just go in. Well, I mean, it was, it was a lot, it was a lot more complicated than that. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, this, this went in stages, all right? May, 1992, I fly from Stockholm. I, I go to LA. I stayed to the end of June. I stayed there six weeks. I work with no sleep every day, every day, every night I'm there. I even drove around with some of the gang police. Mm -hmm. So I, I managed to, on the revisit, because in September of 1992, I go back to Sweden, I go back to LA. And this time I moved there and I, I'm living right. there, right? Do you, so, do you, do you live uh, in the barrio? Do you live in the areas or? No, I lived, I lived closer to Hollywood. Right, okay, yeah. But it didn't matter where you lived because every wall over the city was was gang violence. Right. Yeah. I mean, you see helicopters. I used to go to Vietnam. I mean, it's just like you see helicopters all time, all day and night. Mm -hmm. So you know, the boom, boom, bang, bang stuff was happening everywhere. So mm -hmm. um, on the re on the revisit on the September, now I want to go deeper. Right. I want to go into families. So I went to a school who introduced me to the Mariano Maravilla guys, you know, this younger gang said, now Maravilla is a, is a gang that goes back to the 1920s. Now that was the thing that I learned on the first trip that this gang phenomenon, this is not some gang phenomenon. This is a, a family story. How can you be four, three, four generations out and you're still in the same kind of clique? You know what I'm saying? A little bit different than the average Italian mafia, so to speak, you know what I mean? very different than that in terms of like how a community, a neighborhood can be so impactful on your life, right? On your life, yeah? And so I'm working with Mariana Maravilla. I'm photographing a lot and, and I'm sending the film to New York. My friend Brian would process the film, send me back the contact sheets. I'd say, hey, make me some prints. You know, the usual things with their girlfriends. Or, and. Uh, one night, the, the gang, the gang cops came, the sheriff's gang unit came to their house, um, searching for guns, and I think they found a gun or two. Um, and they told these guys that I was working with them on the car. Mm -hmm. Then I came back, I had a contract on my life. Mm -hmm. And that was when I was going to quit. I just, I, I don't know if I can handle this. I got two kids. So I don't know. I mean, my God. And, uh, you know, I had a good friend, Ruben, who said to me, well, maybe, you know, just breathe and try and see. Because LA is very big, Bartos. So you can go from one side to another side and not see the other side. Mm -hmm. So I go back to a school and then this teacher was really cool. She really tried to help me out. Now, you know, one thing that we missed here was why are we doing this project? Why are we doing this project was first I was influenced by the music. So I, I just went there. Really, honestly, my idea was to go and do like a West Side Story movie in L.A. Right? You're on one gang, you're on another gang. You like these girls, you like to dance, you know, you like cars. You want to get high, you know, that kind of thing. It was very cool. We dressed well. You know, I was into that, right? But when I did the first, when I met the Thomas Regalado, the, the third family, the little boy in the coffin, that was in 92, right? That, I mean, that was in the first trip, right? And we sat together in their kitchen and talked and prayed for her son. I'm Catholic, so we do that, you know, as a, as a natural for our families to do that and pray together. And then while I was, she invited me to come to the funeral at the church. That's why we got that photo. Mm -hmm. And CNN and everybody was upset who I was because I was able to go down to the casket and they weren't. That's because I spent time with them. Mm -hmm. She said the most important thing to me that day, you need to tell this story about our children dying on the streets. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Right. That was, that was the turning point for me. Mm -hmm. 
And so when we go, we go back to the, to the situation at hand, after being very sad and depressed and nervous and scared about like what's about to happen here, I'm introduced to a new gang mm -hmm. called Evergreen. Mm -hmm. And I told them what had happened. I didn't tell them about the contract, but I told them about who I photographed. I showed them who they and said, oh, we want to be in here too. That's their enemy. So it turned out to be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. But then I had to go through the whole acceptance. Again. I had a 14 year old put a, put a gun in my face. Yo. I said, whoa, you're the man, you're the man, you're the boss. Right? Mm -hmm. And they tested me. That's why that night, that one photograph of the four guys and you see the gun like this, mm -hmm. you know, the only thing that's sharp in the whole picture is the gun. Because I was really, really nervous. But I didn't show him I was nervous. And then after that night, you know, we're still friends and tight with Evergreen. We went back in 2012, back in 2014 and 2016. So we revisited three extra times. We're still very close to a lot of these families. It's an ongoing story. You know, it's amazing. Uh, wow. Wow. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's a uh, it's a quite a quite a situation uh, to be in. You know, being um, and death threats and uh, and all that. Um, I wonder if I if I just um, you know you tell me the story of what happened. But you mentioned this um, uh, sending films to New York. Mm -hmm. Did you get this? Uh, did you get this um, uh, films back or? What's going on yeah. Back? No. I mean, I would I would shoot. Because, you know, back then, you know, we didn't have all these issues we have today, right? I mean, you just basically boxed your film, you told them don't x-ray it, and you ship it, and it was fine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was DHL we used back then, you know, that was, that's, I mean, we didn't have FedEx then. So, uh, and National Geographic, when I was working in Africa, that's how we would send our film, right, to Washington. Okay. So, so letting the film go you have to wait a couple of weeks to get back contact sheets you know it was a very nerve-wracking thing but that's just the way we worked back then um just going back to the book then um you you, you said a lot of things and uh, that you can actually see in the book but what i found was quite um, quite telling uh in what you wanted to do uh, is that you actually show a success story you know uh, i think you show like a um you know you you don't uh, obviously, you don't demonize, you concentrate on, 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 on families and stuff, but you actually show that there is a way out, you know. Um, uh, could, you, could you speak a little bit about that and, uh, and how did that go? Well, let me read a quote to you right now, which I think is going to make a... I, I, I'm going to email this to you so you get it correctly, okay? Okay. So this is very important. Now, I got to turn my head because it's on the wall here, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Raised in violence, I enacted my own violence upon the world and, uh, and myself. What saved me was the camera. Its ability to gaze upon, to focus, to investigate, to reclaim, to resist, and last, to re-envision. Mm -hmm. And that's where this hopeful image of Chivo in the back of East Side Stories, I waited two years to take that picture because I already know what the demon is. Mm -hmm. I've been a demon. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we're all, all these prejudices that people have, mm -hmm. you know, about once you're a criminal, you're always a criminal. Mm -hmm. Once you're an addict, you're always an addict. You know, I know what it is to be an addict, but there's still fathers, there's still mothers, there's still love, there's still hugging going on. You just have to look for it. And in the world of photojournalism, we were always taught to show the horrible all the time, show the problem all the time, you know, and you know, that's why I like the documentary process, because the photographers, if I were to take you to L.A. right now and we were to interview some of the guys that are older, a lot older now, they would tell you. Joe. He's not like L.A. Times. He doesn't come in here and just pop, pop, pop and leave. 
he came in there and he's been with us for 20 years. So it's kind of, it's the kind of narratives, Bartos, that sometimes just need time, mm -hmm. right? Because every human being can have problems, mm -hmm. but we work at them and try to change. So that's humanity, I think. All right. Brilliant. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, listen, uh, let's get back to that question that I kind of started to ask uh, before, because we said we will come back. Uh, speaking of, you know, being there for 20 years, which obviously make, make you, make you uh, different than many, but when you have been there, uh, you still been in the, I don't know if to call it system or with media, your images were appearing, the, uh, you know, as uh, you know, the image of of, of that uh, boy's coffin, for example, or the image from the living room that you actually speak a lot about the book. Um, how, uh, what goes through your mind when you actually decide on printing that? Do you, um, how much, because it seems to me that you actually didn't have uh, much saying in what image was chosen is that correct uh, they pick the image and you just had to agree or something like that and how was it seen uh by actually the families you photographed that because that that could be i can see that can be a problematic situation how how did how did that go no no, no for sure um well i'm a photojournalist so <laughs> that means you're working for a media outlet that's going to publish hopefully publish your material i don't have control over that Right. I mean, I think today's world, Bartos, there's a lot of discussions going on on representation in Europe and even in here in the United States. Absolutely. And it's timely. It's important time to talk about this. Um, so I also worked as, as, a, as a storyteller, as a photojournalist to help feed my family. All right. I mean, pay my rent. So there's a lot of compromising going on there. The reason why I make books is because of that problem. Right. Okay, I can tell a longer story, not just in two pages, right? And <coughs> um, I think in general, I was taught through the platforms of the World Press Photo Awards, the National Press Photo Awards. And you would look at the history of those awards and see who, what images get the awards as they do, right? Mm -hmm. And lots of times it's pain and suffering, it's war, it's, you know, the classic, you know, you know, Muslim woman who just lost her child in Palestine holding the baby. You know, how many times have we seen that image? You know, so there are all these kind of moments that almost become, we've seen them so many times, they almost become like a cliche in a way, right? And I just never really got that many awards. I did get some awards, but, you know, especially, all right, so with East Side Stories, let's just be very clear. And I worked. the first trip and some of the second trip and black star is my photo agency. So now we're, we're going to life magazine. I've got about 25, uh, 16 by 20, 40 by 50 centimeter prints, right. In a box. And I go up to see David friend at life magazine, who was the photo editor at the time. And what I wanted to try to do was to, to make a photo essay, which was our dream, right? Like Eugene Smith of, of gang life in America. Right. What is the life of a gang member? That's what the whole thing was about. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there were just, as you know, there were a lot of guns on the street. And we had a senator that was shot, right, and paralyzed to an automatic weapon. His name was Brady, uh, Senator Brady. And um, they were passing, or they put into the Senate, a bill, an assault weapons ban, which was taken away with President Trump, OK? So just so you understand the history of what's happening. Um, and you know what's been happening in the last 10 years. So I don't even have to go there with all the shootings going on here. So I called um, a very close friend of mine, Sandy Close, who was the executive director of the, at that time, the Pacific News Service, which has changed their title name 
at the media department now and stuff like that. So she said to me sometimes, because I was very nervous about Lisa. Mm -hmm. uh, um, oh, the question became what photo they wanted to use. Okay, so the photo, of course, the one they wanted to run was the one with Chivo with the baby and the guns in the living room. So I, I talked to, to a good friend of mine who was still close today, and he's Andy Close, um, a very important person. She used to be a big editor at Newsday newspaper in New York, and I went to California many, many years. Anyway, she said to me, sometimes a photograph is bigger than us. Mm -hmm. And she gave me some examples, which I put together very quickly. One was the Vietnam War, the My Lai, the, the young girl running down the street with no clothes on with Agent Orange all over her. Uh, Kent State with the National Guard shooting students. Yeah. Uh, images of the Charles Moore images of, 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 of the people um, um, down south uh, fighting for justice with Martin Luther King. Yeah, with the dogs and everything. And those images help change society's point of view. Mm -hmm. So she convinced me to allow them to run that photo along with the caption talking about the assault weapons ban. Because at that point, all the parents that lost children in Los Angeles were in my head. And having two babies, having twins, you know, that young affected me as a father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that one thing that I can't stand about our country is guns. Because in one second, your life is taken away. And then everybody else's life is ruined. And I've seen it many times, whether it's in war in Afghanistan or LA or South Bronx, or it doesn't matter. It, gun takes away your life in a second. And the parents who are suffering to, to this day, right? You know, wow. I had to let that go. So I called Chivo. You know, the next question is, was, what, did, what was the response? Mm -hmm. And I called him. And I said, listen, they're going to run this picture in Life magazine. And they're going to pay us. If it's okay with you. I'll give you half the money. But you got to be okay with this. Now, I didn't have to ask him that because he signed a model release, right? I didn't even have to be this guy. So that's how it would happen. Yeah, it's a fascinating, um, fascinating story. I was actually thinking about uh, about that a lot. Um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't so serious, but I've been in a similar situation, so I can see. Um, can't say similar. It's not about guns, but I understand as a photographer that there is like you know, um, um, there are issues there. Um, you know, moving on to uh, juvenile. Uh, mm -hmm. It feels like you just continue speaking, um, speaking, uh, speaking your own story, and uh, you know, uh, it's a clear continuation of the previous previous project. Um, was that exactly the reason why you decided to shoot that? You know, just to see what happened with the with the, with the kids that are being taken. Obviously, you photograph them prior to that. Is it time now to photograph um, what's happening with them in the institutions? Yeah. 